Thank you very much. An extract much. from chapter two, The God Hypothesis. The God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction. <laughs> Jealous and proud of it, a petty, unjust, unforgiving control freak, a vindictive, bloodthirsty ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, genocidal, filicidal, pestilential, megalomaniacal, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. <laughs> Those of us schooled from infancy in his ways can become desensitized to their horror. A naive, blessed with a perspective of innocence, has a clearer perception. Winston Churchill's son, Randolph, somehow contrived to remain ignorant of scripture until Evelyn Waugh and a brother officer, in a vain attempt to keep Churchill quiet when they were posted together during the war, bet him he couldn't read the entire Bible in a fortnight. Unhappily, it has not had the result we hoped. He has never read any of it before and is hideously excited, keeps reading quotations aloud. I say, I bet you didn't know this came in the Bible. <laughs> or merely slapping his side and chortling, God, isn't God a shit? <laughs> Thomas Jefferson, better read, was of a similar opinion. The Christian God is a being of terrific character, cruel, vindictive, capricious and unjust. It is unfair to attack such an easy target. The God hypothesis should not stand or fall with its most unlovely instantiation, Yahweh, nor his insipidly opposite Christian face, gentle Jesus, meek and mild. To be fair, this milksop persona owes more to his Victorian followers than to Jesus himself. Could anything be more mawkishly nauseating than Mrs. C.F. Alexander's Christian children all must be mild, obedient, good as he? I am not attacking the particular qualities of Yahweh or Jesus or Allah or any other specific god such as Baal, Zeus or Wotan. Instead, I shall define the god hypothesis more defensively. There exists a superhuman, supernatural intelligence who deliberately designed and created the universe and everything in it, including us. This book will advocate an alternative view. Any creative intelligence of sufficient complexity to design anything comes into existence only as the end product of an extended process of gradual evolution. Creative intelligences being evolved necessarily arrive late in the universe and therefore cannot be responsible for designing it. God, in the sense defined, is a delusion and, as later chapters will show, a pernicious delusion. Not surprisingly, since it is founded on local traditions of private revelation rather than evidence, the God hypothesis comes in many versions. Historians of religion recognize a progression from primitive tribal animisms through polytheisms such as those of the Greeks, Romans, and Norsemen, to monotheisms such as Judaism and its derivatives, Christianity and Islam. Christianity claims to be a monotheistic religion, but you have to wonder sometimes. Rivers of medieval ink, not to mention blood, have been squandered over the mystery of the Trinity and in suppressing deviations such as the Arian heresy. Arius of Alexandra in Alexandria in the 4th century AD denied that Jesus was consubstantial, i.e. of the same substance or essence, with God. What on earth could this possibly mean, you're probably asking? Substance? What substance? What exactly do you mean by essence? Very little seems the only reasonable reply. Yet the controversy split Christendom down the middle for a century, and the Emperor Constantine ordered that all copies of Arius' book should be burned. Splitting Christendom by splitting hairs, such has ever been the way of theology. Do we have one God in three parts, or three gods in one? The Catholic Encyclopedia clears up the matter for us in a masterpiece of theological close reasoning. In the unity of the Godhead, there are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, these three persons being truly distinct 
one from another. Thus, in the words of the Athanasian Creed, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God, and yet there are not three gods, but one God. <laughs> As if that were not clear enough, the encyclopedia quotes the third century theologian, St. Gregory the Miracle Worker. There is therefore nothing created, nothing subject to another in the Trinity, nor is there anything that has been added as though it once had not existed, but had entered afterwards. Therefore the Son has never been without the Father, nor the Son without the Spirit, and this same Trinity is immutable and unalterable forever. Whatever miracles may have earned St. Gregory his nickname, they were not miracles of honest lucidity. His words convey the characteristically obscurantist flavor of theology, which, unlike science or most other branches of human scholarship, has not moved on in 18 centuries. Thomas Jefferson, as so often, got it right when he said, ridicule is the only weapon which can be used against unintelligible propositions. Ideas must be distinct before reason can act upon them, and no man ever had a distinct idea of the Trinity. It is the mere abracadabra of the mountebanks calling themselves the priests of Jesus. Jefferson heaped ridicule on the doctrine that, as he put it, there are three gods in his critique of Calvinism. But it is especially the Roman Catholic branch of Christianity that pushes its recurrent flirtation with polytheism towards runaway inflation. The Trinity is, are, joined by Mary, Queen of Heaven, a goddess in all but name, who surely runs God himself a close second as a target of prayers. The Pantheon is further swollen by an army of saints, whose intercessory power makes them, if not demigods, well worth approaching on their own specialist subjects. The Catholic Community Forum helpfully lists 5,120 saints, together with their areas of expertise, which include abdominal pains, abuse victims, anorexia, arms dealers, blacksmiths, broken bones, bomb technicians, and bowel disorders, to venture no further than the bees. Pope John Paul II created more saints than all his predecessors of the past several centuries put together, and he had a special affinity with the Virgin Mary. His polytheistic hankerings were dramatically demonstrated in 1981 when he suffered an assassination attempt in Rome and attributed his survival to intervention by Our Lady of Fatima. A maternal hand guided the bullet. One cannot help wondering why she didn't guide it to miss him altogether. <laughs> <coughs> Others might think the team of surgeons who operated on him for six hours deserved at least a share of the credit, <laughs> but perhaps their hands too were maternally guided. The relevant point is that it wasn't just Our Lady who, in the Pope's opinion, guided the bullet, but specifically Our Lady of Fatima. Presumably Our Lady of Lourdes, Our Lady of Guadeloupe, Our Lady of Medjugorje, Our Lady of Akita, Our Lady of Zaitun, Our Lady of Garabandal, and Our Lady of Nock were busy on other errands at the time. 